Okay, it's working. Good. Well, thanks for asking me to open up the conference at 9 o'clock in the morning. I'm glad it's starting later than 9 o'clock. Um, what I will be talking mainly about is comparing the conventional views of money, the mainstream views, to the modern monetary approach. And uh, if you, have you, some of you may have seen a, I can't really call it a debate, more a slanging match that occurred between me and Paul Krugman on the uh, internet back 2012 when he read a paper I was giving at the Berlin, actually Berlin Island INET conference. And uh, ended up making a range of statements that are just straight textbook views about the nature of money and the nature of banking. And so I'm saying, first of all, an individual bank does in fact have to lend out money it receives in deposits. <laughs> And then the bank, they can't issue out of thin air. They must have assets with funds, buy assets with funds they already have on hand. So that's its initial vision. Now, uh, I still remember seeing in 2014 an article come out from a, come from a central bank, the Bank of England, completely trashing that view. And absolutely delighted because with monetary, non-orthodox monetary theorists like myself, right back to Basil Moore, and as, as Dirk said, going right back to um, Eccles, who was the head of the um, Federal Reserve in the, the, war, the war and post-war period, saying this is nonsense. Uh, we found ourselves in the wilderness, and suddenly we find ourselves in the shade of a central bank. So this is the Bank of England in 2014 saying, rather than banks receiving deposits and then lending them out, bank lending creates deposits, which directly contradicts that view from a Nobel Prize winner, which, of course, I'm actually going to be giving him probably awarding him the Nobel Prize in economics later on this year. I think these guys have nobbled progress in economics for over half a century. And then of all things, I really almost fell over when this came out. I always forgot the Bundesbank was always going to be in the opposition camp. Uh-uh. Bundesbank, same thing. Refutes a popular misconception that banks are simply intermediaries. Now, normally when you talk about a popular misconception, it's something the public believes that the experts know is wrong. <laughs> this is the reverse. <laughs> the public tends to know what banks do, and the so-called experts in economics have got it wrong. So it's rather strange to call a popular misconception, but that's the reality. And they carried on very nicely to say, you look, the creation of book money is a straightforward accounting entry, set of accounting entries, to grasp that money and credit are created as a result of interactions between banks, non-banks, and the central bank. And a bank's ability to grant loans has nothing to do with excess reserves or deposits it has had. So completely categorically trashing what is still taught in 99% of universities around the world. Now, after that happens, this is the reaction of Krugman to that. Colour me puzzled. I've seen people touting this as offering some kind of, kind of radical new way of looking at the economy. He said it's a good piece, but it doesn't really change what I already believe, which is completely contradictory to what has just been said in that paper. And this is why they tend to fob off uh, criticisms from the outside. Um, now, when you look at them in terms of why do they not see the financial crisis coming, the question that the Queen of England asked them. Uh, when you read Ben Bernanke's essays on the Great Depression, you would imagine he considered every argument of any, any substance about what caused the crisis, and one of those was Irving Fisher's debt deflation theory of the Great Depression. And I was reading it, I just, I've ceased being horrified by the nonsense mainstream economists write. Okay? But I was still just went, oh, you've got to be joking. Here he's talking about Fisher and says that debt deflation represents no more than a redistribution from one group, the debtors, to another group, the creditors. Now, even that's absurd, because when a debt deflation, people go bankrupt and they don't pay the creditors back. How can you be so damn naive? Simple. Do it a PhD in economics. <laughs> uh, and then he says, absent implausibly large differences in marginal spending propensities, pure redistributions and that's what they see credit as, should have no significant macroeconomic effects. Now, after the crisis, they, 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 of course, this hit them like a brick wall. They had no idea they were driving into a, into a, a brick wall. So, you know, how in the hell did this happen? Well, here's Leah Harney. Now, you wouldn't know the name necessarily. Some of you might know the names of Kidland and Prescott. They're the ones who dreamt up... Uh, the, uh, the nightmare of real business cycle theory. Ohanian is a strong associate of Prescott, and he's, um, I mentioned he's a Federal Reserve <coughs> advisor there. So the financial explanation, now he, here he's saying that the financial explanation for the financial crisis must be wrong. So, so the financial explanation argues that it became worse because of a significant contraction in intermediation services. That's what they see banking as, intermediating between savers and borrowers. This is the very conventional view. But he said, but in some measures of intermediation have not declined substantially. He says, figure four shows that bank credit, 
relative nominal GDP rose to an all-time high. It did decline, but bank credit was still higher at this point than any time before 2000, halfway 2008. These data suggest that aggregate quantities of intermediation volumes have not declined markedly. Okay? Well, he made the mistake of putting a chart in. This is his figure four. This is published in one of the leading neoclassical journals. Actually, it's a bit, bit more progressive than that. It does actually publish some non-orthodox stuff, the Journal of Economic Perspectives. And yes, it does say credit, and when you look at the statistics that it's taken from, the statisticians describe it as credit. Okay? He interprets that as the change in debt. Okay. Now take a look. Take a look at the axis. Is the change in debt every year twice the size of GDP? You know the old story about somebody putting a rice grain on one square of a scope and then a two and then four. This is one and then uh, well, that's, it's one and then three and then nine and so on. And he thinks that if that happened, debt would be 75,000 billion to the power of 30 times the level of GDP right now. It's not credit. It is the ratio of private debt to GDP. So he made what I would call a typical schoolboy error of not simply understanding the data he thought he could use to reject the argument that the financial crisis was caused by the financial system. And it didn't just get past him. It got past the editors and the referees of a leading neoclassical journal. Now, how on earth can the so-called exports make a mistake that big? It's because economic theory, mainstream economic theory, tends to completely ignore the monetary system. So when they look at it, they haven't got a clue what they're looking at, and they make total stuff-ups like that. So I want to show what actually is going on using his term, the aggregate quantities of intermediation volumes. My God, it's exciting to read economics, you know, <laughs> such sexy language, uh, is the rate of change of debt. Now, the red line there is the level of private debt in America. That's, that's comparable to the data series he was showing. The blue line down below is what he, what he was actually thought he was talking about, which is the annual change in debt, which is what credit is. Now, that peaked at 15% of GDP in 2008. It fell to minus 5% in 2010. So there was a big change in what he would call intermediation services. But according again to their theory, they should have no relationship with aggregate demand and therefore should have no impact upon economic, macroeconomic consequences like the level of unemployment. Well, let's do a bit of a correlation here. Is anybody here old enough to remember what a Rorschach plot is? <laughs> okay. This data looks like a Rorschach plot. One goes up, the other goes down. A bit of a deviation towards the end there because of the scale of quantitative easing, in my opinion, in the States. But it's a massive negative correlation. Credit up, unemployment down. Now, according to them, according to Bernanke, as you saw in the earlier slide, there should be no significant macroeconomic effect. I think a correlation coefficient of the magnitude of 0.85 is pretty damn significant. And this is what they've been ignoring for a decade since the financial crisis and all the way forward through beforehand. So clearly credit affects aggregate demand, but they can't understand why. And this is again in my little slanging match with Krugman. He came out at one stage and said, Keynes seems to be saying that creating money equals creating demand. But again, that isn't right in any model I understand. And he's completely correct. It isn't right in any model he understands. So I want to help him out. Okay. So this is getting slightly technical here. I'm going to stretch the brain cells a bit. I hope you all had your caffeine, caffeine for the morning. Good, okay. Imagine dividing the economy into three sectors, just one, two, and three. They could be anything at all. Uh, and have them spending on each other. And I'm going to consider three situations. One where there's no lending and no borrowing, and I call that Say's Law. But in fact, it's the reverse of Say's Law. Rather than supply creating its own demand, it's actually demand creating its own supply. We'll see that in a moment. The second is where lending between sectors is possible, and that's what they think happens. That's what Krugman describes as loanable funds. A patient agent lends to an impatient agent, literally how he describes it. And by the way, I really appreciate how economists ignore pejorative language when they put their theories forward. Who's the good person, the patient or the impatient one? Uh, and then the final one, the real world, banks lend to, a, to one sector and that sector then spends on the other. And I, we used to call this endogenous money and I want to change the terminology because only somebody working in the area knows what the hell you mean by endogenous money. So I've got a new acronym called BOMBED, Bank Originated Money and Debt. Okay? So just to tell people who have been bombed by the banking sector, more likely to be I term, I think we'll get the idea across. I'm going to show flows of existing money by capital letters, 
and flows with loans signified just by the word credit, which could be what they think it is, it could be what we know it is. We'll see in a moment. And I'm using, I'll call this a Moore table after Basil Moore, who's one of the leading founders of endogenous money theory since the 1970s. And I haven't yet built this into my Minsky software, but when I get funding, I'm going to do this. And what this shows is expenditure across the row and income down the columns for each of those sectors. And the, the rows must sum to zero because I'm showing spending by one sector on the other two, and these, the sum must necessarily be zero. But the columns can sum to non-zero because your expenditure can be greater than your income or vice versa. Now, this gives me an array of numbers, which the mathematicians call a matrix. And so the, the diagonal shows the expenditure and that's negative. Uh, and that's expenditure. The total of expenditure is you sum up and take the negative of the diagonal of this matrix. The off diagonal is the income and they are necessarily equal. So here's the Say's Law world. So sector one spends A on sector two and B on sector three. Sector two sends C on sector one and D on sector three, etc. And if you add up the, the, uh, each of those elements, there's expenditure by sector one. There's the income generated by the expenditure of that sector because expenditure creates income. That's why I call it the sales law in reverse. And that's the income for sector one. Of course, A, B and C and D can differ. So that income can, some can be non-zero, but the horizontal must be zero. Now, that's effectively Friedman's quantity theory of money, because if you imagine there's a certain stock of money turning over so many times per year, the sum of A to F is that money velocity money multiplied by the velocity of, of uh, velocity of circulation of money. And if I'm, I'm using a mathematics logic program here just to show that I'm not making any mistakes. I made an arithmetic mistake and a thing I typed in a presentation I gave two days ago. Uh, these are all logical. I'm showing, no, there's no mathematical errors here. So I take the, take the trace, substitute a, eight, a plus out to F with V times N, the velocity of money times the stock of money. It's Milton Friedman. That's that world. What about Krugman's beloved loanable funds? Okay. Well, sector two is lending to sector one. And what I show in that case, the flow of lending goes along the diagonal. Money which would otherwise be spent by sector two is given to sector one, and then sector one then spends that on sector three. And then sector one, of course, sector two only lends to sector one because they expect to be paid interest. So there's a flow of interest to sector two. And of course, that has to be based on the interest rate times the level of outstanding loans. If there's a flow of loans, which is dollars per year, there must be a stock of loans, which is dollars. And you multiply that by the interest rate to get the, the, uh, the interest payments. And then sector one spends that on sector three. So now what I've got, as you can see, is that credit is flowing from sector two to sector one. And then sector one is spending that credit on sector three. And sector one, because they've borrowed the money, they've got an outstanding stock of debt, they've got to pay interest on that to sector two. So that's the overall pattern. And all the rows sum to zero, as they must necessarily do. So the credit spending that sector two is, is this credit sector two is spending to sector one reduces this, the money they are spending on one of the other sectors. And I could make it more general, but this is, to use the classic mathematical phrase, this works without loss of generality. Okay? It works no matter what, how complicated the interfaces are. C and D might be different to what they were before the credit. That's possible too. I'm just looking at the flow of credit itself. Now, when you do the same exercise, you sum up the, the, uh, the, the horizontal and do the same substitution as I did before, credit cancels out. Okay. What you've got over here is money velocity plus the financial transactions. And if I had deposit interest being paid, by the way, I'd get gross financial transactions. I'd be adding the interest paid on deposits as well to that, not subtracting, but adding. So credit cancels out. What that means is, if loanable trends were true, then you could ignore banking and macroeconomics because it would be a pure, pure redistribution. It wouldn't add to aggregate demand. It might change it a bit because sector one might spend more per year than sector two does, but it'd be a trivial change. Now, the real world. I'm, I'm really apologise to any economists who I'm tracking to someone they've never been before if they're in the audience, but, you know. Okay. Sector, a, banking, a bank lends to sector, sector one creating money in the process, and then sector one spends that money on sector three. So I'm not showing the, the, the assets of the bank in this situation because the increase in the, this is actually showing the bank account transactions plus also the equity of the bank. And uh, the assets of the bank have risen by the loan. That's not shown in the table because it would just be too small. If I put that on the screen, you can see it. So I'm looking at the liability side. The asset side matches the liability side by an increase in the assets equal to the amount of credit 
being extended. Now, if I do the same exercise here, I get credit is part of aggregate demand and aggregate income. That's the punchline. So endogenous money, bank originated money and debt has significant macroeconomic impacts because credit, whether or not you're talking about asset markets, credit is part of aggregate demand and aggregate income. So that's a logical conclusion I reached after a debate with Mark Lavoie and Brett Feiberger and a few more in the review of Keynesian economics a couple of years ago. Credit does not cancel out. So credit is a part of aggregate demand, and if you leave it out of aggregate, your analysis of aggregate demand, you've left out not the major component, because the sum of turnover of existing money is larger, but by far the most volatile. So you can't see the turning points in the economy coming, and that's why they're taken completely by surprise. So what neoclassical economists do, which is ignore the banking sector and ignore private debt in their analysis, is structurally wrong about a capitalist economy. And that's why they didn't see the crisis coming. Now, I know I'm never going to convert a neoclassical on this front, but one way to point out how wrong they are is to take one of their models and then show that they're right if their model's correct and they're wrong if the structure economy is different. So I took a model that Krugman and Eggertson had in a supplement to their paper uh, in, the, in the Quarterly Journal of Economics with a patient consuming agent leading to an impatient investment goods agent within the bank charging intermediation fee. And this is my software package called Minsky, which is open source, um, freely downloadable from SourceForge. If you want to test it out, uh, you can load it yourself and see how it runs. If you, I'll put this presentation up on Dirk's website at some point, and you can actually simulate it and see it yourself. I'm just going to see if the software, there we go. So what, I'm, what I've got here, these are each uh, representing a double entry view of the economy from the bank's point of view, the investment sector, the consumer sector, and the workers using this model of loanable funds. And over here, I've got a set of controls where I can vary how fast lending occurs. Now, what they see is happening is that the banking sector is just an intermediary, which means the lending is actually occurring between the consumer sector deposit account and the investment sector deposit account. There's money coming out of the credit of the of the account of the credit of the uh, consumer agent going into the account of the investment agent. There's repayment. There's interest payments. There's the fee being paid to the bank, and then with the money in their accounts, the work the consumer sector hires workers. The investment sector hires workers. The consumer sector investment sector buys consumer consumer goods. The consumer sector buys investment goods. Workers consume, bankers consume, and bankers invest. Follow that? Okay. I did it a bit fast, but that's one of the advantages of double entry bookkeeping. If I tried to do this using a standard system dynamics diagram, you'd be seeing wires going all over the place, and you'd need, you'd need another cup of coffee. But at least with, the, I think the, the accounting double entry table was probably the world's first graphical user interface, and it's very important, very useful to use it for this system. So that's the model, and then this is seeing it from the investment sector's point of view and the consumer <coughs> sector. Now you'll notice in that model, debt doesn't turn up. Why? Because in this model, if the bank's intermediating, the debt is not an asset of the bank. It's an asset of the consumer sector. So you come over here and you see that it's shown as an asset of the consumer sector. So it doesn't turn up on the bank's books at all. Now, and there's an operations lending and repayment, shuffle the amount of money in the consumer sector's deposit account across the debt and vice versa. Okay, now I simulate this model. And what I get is an economy that has a growth rate of zero. GDP is flatlining at 200. There's an increasing level of debt, but no change in the amount of money. And if I speed up how fast lending occurs, notice the growth rate actually drops. And if I slow down repayment, it drops even further because the, lend the lending agent actually has a higher propensity to consume in this model than the investing agent. You can see a rising level of debt. The debt to GDP ratio is now hitting 100% uh, there and rising further, it'll stabilise at some point, there's been a huge increase in debt, bugger all change in GDP. Now if I go the opposite direction and, and speed up how fast people repay loans and slow down how fast banks uh, fall, there's actually a spike, the, the GDP goes up for a short while with the growth rate, but ultimately a huge plunge in the debt level, again bugger all long term change in GDP. So if they were right about loanable funds being the actual nature of banking, you could ignore 
banking completely and doing macroeconomics without losing any really important details. And that's what Bernanke was arguing when he didn't bother analysing Fisher's argument, as Fisher put it. He made his own neoclassical bastardisation of it instead. Now, what I can do with Minsky, and that's one reason I designed it as well, it's very hard to edit a model of financial flows using the flowchart software that's a standard in system dynamics. But it's very easy to edit this in Minsky. So I can say, well, look, it's bullshit that the debt is an asset of the consumer sector. So I can just delete that asset. And I can delete the operations of lending, debt repayment, interest payments, and bank fees. And of course, once I've done that, I've removed debt as an asset in the banking sector, but it's still there in the model, but it's still there as a liability of the investment sector. So I can come over to here and say, here are the assets of the banking sector, make room for an extra column of assets, say that there's debt as an asset which hasn't been, a, a liability that hasn't been allocated as an asset to anybody else in the system. Minsky brings over the operations that still exist. I simply have to edit this and say interest payments are made to the bank and let's get rid of this silly idea of a bank fee. There's a couple of other changes I should make to make it completely correct, but this will do. Having done that, what happens to the model? I rerun it with the same initial conditions. And now you can see that rising level of debt is causing a rising money stock. GDP is positive and growing. As the debt ratio rises, the economy also rises. If we now have faster lending, the growth rate pops up. Slower repayment pops up even further. Oh, I went the wrong way with repayment. That's got to go the other way. Just increase slow down how fast repayment's made, jump in GDP. If now there's a decision to repay more rapidly and to lend more slowly, we have an economic slump. That's all it takes. I've changed nothing else in the model. They're exactly identical except for saying who's got the asset of the bank and does lending create money or does it not create money. That's why they didn't see the crisis coming. That's how simple to show where the crisis came from. So it's a major, major error in their thinking to leave out the role of banks, but they do it because if they don't, they've got to consider the monetary system and that gives them a non-equilibrium world and they don't like being out of equilibrium, poor little buggers. They're real snowflakes. You know. So that's what I've done and that's the, the charts show the completed result there. So it goes from saying debt doesn't matter at all, the debt is absolutely crucial in analysing capitalism. Uh, and that's what the modern monetary theory insights provide as well, okay? Uh, uh, this, this can be used to do any model that people want to do of modern monetary theory in terms of the monetary dynamics. Minsky is designed to do that. So bank uh, originated money and debt is very straightforward. Bank lending creates money and debt. Borrowers spend the newly created money and that creates demand, creates income, creates asset bubbles and so on. So that's just what I want to do is a simple stylized structure of what's going on. This is what I've shown you beforehand. That's all I need. That table alone is enough to model endogenous money, bank originated money and debt. So I've got four tables there for completeness, but just one table showing the bank's perspective is enough to give the entire story. There's lending, create debt and money. Uh, there's borrowers spending and creating demand when they do it. And there's repayment, which destroys money. All those elements are simply shown in one table. That's all you need. Now, what if you want to do the models they have, loanable funds? Well, again, debt's not an asset of the bank. So I can't do it with a single table. I've got to have at least two, one to show the bank being the point through which the transactions occur, and that's what's going on there. There's no debt. So to bring debt in, because debt's an asset of the non-bank sector, I've got to have the table for them as well. So it's a more complicated model. Okay? And this is the thing, they talk about their models being simple. No, they're complicated. Okay, They've got to be complicated to hide the real world from themselves, which they've done very successfully. So the loanable funds pretends the debt's an asset of the non-banking sector. I'm sorry, the data shows that it's an asset of the banking sector. Uh, now, fractional reserve banking and money multiply, that's another model they think is really simple. But that only works if you pay all the money out in cash. Because if you look at the, the table and you show lending from reserves to loans, where's the money? Somebody's agreed to go in debt to the bank. Where's the money? Okay. Well, it's been taken out of the bank because the bank reserves have fallen. So the only way that can work is if the loan's either taken out as cash or a negotiable government bank check. So you've got to have another table showing cash as an asset of the borrower and therefore lending increases the cash and repayment reduces the cash. So it's more complicated. 
they pretend it's simpler, but it's not. It's more complicated. There's cash as an asset. So the only way that model works would be if all loans, you know, you go to the bank, you want to buy a place in Berlin for $2 million, you walk inside there and they give you $2 million and $100, note, $100 euro notes. Yeah, sure. Okay. That might have happened in the 1960s. So it is possible in that sense, historically, you can see bank loans may have been in cash at some point in time, and therefore this model would not be a complete caricature. But in the modern electronic world in which we live in, it's a total caricature. Lending increases your deposit account. Using your credit card increases your debt to the bank and increases the deposit account of the person you're shopping with. That's the real world. It's about bloody time they joined it, or actually probably better time they left it. <laughs> make life easier not to have them around. So cre credit and debt are fundamental to capitalism, and when you have a model that includes that, you can get the financial prices they can't explain. This is getting slightly more technical, but they, the, the, a major reason why they've got so tied up in nonsense is they believe they have to have sound foundations for building macroeconomics. And their idea is you must derive macro from micro. Now that to me is a bit like trying to derive the properties of water by extrapolating from a single molecule of H2O. So there therefore must be there must be ice molecules of H2O, water molecules of H2O, and snowflake molecules of H2O. There ain't no such thing. It's the interactions of identical molecules that give you all those different states of water. You've got to work at the macro level to understand it. And I found the same thing with my model of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. I can derive it directly from macro definitions. So I take the number of people who've got a job divided by population. I call that the employment rate. Anybody want to disagree with the definition? And that's the beauty of it. I'm working from definitions that can't be challenged. The wages share of GDP. Wages divided by GDP. Nobody dispute that. Private debt ratio. Debt divided by GDP. In other words, this is strong macro foundations for macroeconomics. Now, if you differentiate those with respect to time, you turn them into three dynamic statements of truisms. They are the employment rate will rise if economic growth exceeds the sum of growth and labour productivity and population. The wage share of output will rise if wage demands grow faster than labour productivity. And the profit debt will ratio will rise, will do, if debt grows faster than GDP. They're simple, those are actually definitional statements. They're so far not a model. Now, if I add very, very simple concepts here, ignoring all the complexity they get into in trying to define people's behaviour, all this nonsense about rational expectations, which means the capacity to accurately prophesize the future, just use simple linear definitions for the capital output ratio, wage change as a function of the employment rate, investment as a function of the profit rate, and credit financing investment. So I don't have any Ponzi behaviour inside here. I get a model that looks like this, and you'll notice I've got verb, I just uh, to highlight there, I, I could actually expand as well. I'm using work, full words here to explain the logic. It's exactly what I showed you beforehand with, the, uh, with, the, with those few uh, definitions added in. And if I simulate this model in, oh, hang on, I've got an accidental writing a note there, I've got to delete that. If I now simulate this and start from a low desire by capitalists to invest, then I get a model that does what neoclassicals think happens all the time, and it slowly converges to equilibrium. They don't do anything that's dynamic, all this stuff is uh, pathetic from a mathematical point of view in terms of how they do dynamics. But you can tell the trend there is for the, the cycles of wages versus employment share are converging, the debt ratio is slowly topping out. <coughs> wages share is falling, notice that, De debt ratio rising, income distribution is going in favour of bankers, uh, capitalists who are down here are cycling around the same constant level. It's worker share, it's slowly falling, but it often <laughs> stabilises and you'll have a constant, there will be flat lines if I let the simulation go on for long enough. Now that's what they think the real world is like and they don't understand you can actually have an unstable equilibrium. So I'm now going to increase the, the willingness of capitalists to invest. And when I start simulating it, it looks like it's doing exactly the same thing for a while. Notice the cycles are getting smaller more rapidly than the other simulation I just showed you. Okay. Watch what happens. Notice the cycles are starting to get bigger. And debt ratio has risen much more than it did in the previous simulation. They call this experience the great moderation, and they patted themselves on the back for their great management of the economy. This they called the great recession, and they said it was due to exogenous shocks. 
Okay? It's the same process. One leads to the other. You can't see this unless you use a complex systems model. Once you do, it pops out incredibly easily. This is a very simple linear model in terms of behavior. I haven't got price dynamics inside there. What I get is a much more elaborate model that has the same basic dynamics as this. So this is like an underlying model for the financial instability we've experienced in the last uh, 20 to 40 years. And trend, things happen in there which are, which are very similar to the real world. Wages share of GDP rises, banker share increase, it falls, banker share increases. That's called rising inequality, guys. Okay? Workers are poor, bankers are rich. A period of diminishing cycles followed by rising ones, and ultimately a crisis. That's what we actually went through. So that's how simple it is to provide a well-founded, indisputable start for macroeconomics, which gives us what we've seen in the real world. Incredibly simple model compared to any of their models, which takes weeks to derive. It just takes minutes to derive the model I've just shown you. So it's neat. Their theory is neat. It's plausible. And it's fundamentally wrong. And it's as useful to economics as Ptolemy's Earth-centric model with epicycles and so on was to astronomy. And it emphasizes the strengths of capitalism, features that it doesn't have. A tendency towards equilibrium. Well, bullshit. It's got a tendency towards cycles and instability. Pardon my Australian, I'm getting a bit more Australian the longer I stay away from academia. Uh, there's no classes in their model, so there's no class conflict. Come on. Uh, and it sees strengths where capitalism has weaknesses. They have this idea of efficient markets versus the actual destabilising role of finance. And they ignore the strengths that capitalism does have. Capitalism has the strongest enticement to innovation, of probably any society outside from original Cro-Magnon uh, humanity where we started inventing the fire and the wheel and so on. Okay, there's a strong, uh, spontaneous, finance-driven, uh, in many ways, and encouragement of innovation. That's what we should be talking about, the strengths of capitalism. So not only for the sake of capitalism, but also so for the sake of planet, mainstream economics has to go. We need a new economics based on realism. I'm going to do a bit of a plug for myself here and my various colleagues. Universities are completely dominated by the neoclassicals. People like myself, like Randall Ray, like Bill Mitchell, only get to work in small provincial universities where funding is very fragile. We can lose our positions completely. That happened to me at Uni University of Western Sydney. One government policy change which affected all humanities subjects at lower ranking universities dropped our potential enrolments from 120 students to 16 in one year. At Kingston, a similar thing happened just before I arrived. Over time, because the English system is more sclerotic, we went from 140 students to about 70, in line with the rest of the humanities that halved their numbers at that university, making that program non-viable. So we're not going to survive. We need to work outside the universities to develop a new economics. And in fact, it's going to be central banks and potentially treasuries and even the World Bank that does better work here because unlike the economists in academia, those guys, those women, have their genitals on the line if things go wrong. Not necessarily in the World Bank, but I have seen some politicians chew out members of the Reserve Banks when their forecast comes in completely wrong. So there is some pressure then to actually get in, in touch with the real world. There's a marvellous student organisation called Rethinking Economics, which has been going for almost 10 years now. Support that. The monetary reform groups, from everything from positive money to MMT, they are all taking on the mainstream from different perspectives. They all deserve support. And as I said, you can support me via crowdfunding if you wish to. That's my Patreon site. Thank you. So the questions are what I got out of the way. Questions. Okay, yeah. I'm going to be MC Dirk. And, yeah. yeah. So if you have any questions or comments. Exactly, exactly the same as I've shown you beforehand. The government has to run. If you if you're going to have the private sector uh, saving money, the government has to be running a deficit. Okay. Germany, all 
runs a surplus, it tries to run a surplus, and then yeah. the private sector is always to increase its debt level. Yeah, so the delta factor is the trade balance, and you're running, Germany's running about a 10% of GDP trade balance. So it's quite possible for Germany to have uh, reducing government debt, so you're running a government surplus, reducing private debt, so you're having a private surplus, the trade deficit is allowing you to do both of those. So Germany is an extremely bad country, to use an example for the rest of the world, because it depends upon doing what the rest of the world can't do when it tells the rest of the world to do what it does. Just yeah. to clarify, that'd be current account. That doesn't. That can be trade, but it can also be all financial. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. But I think I'm. I'm. That's one point. I do differ with MMT. I think they've got a wrong attitude on trade. Okay. And that's something I wanted to explore later. But it's on the monetary stuff. Completely consistent with them. And certainly, the government should be running a deficit all the time. Okay. Not a case of deficits during slumps and, and surpluses during booms. The consistent situation compared to the rate of inflation, compared to major economic objectives, could be the government should be running a deficit. And if you look at the American data, over 120 years, despite the desire of politicians to run a surplus, for the simplistic views they have, the average surplus they've run for the last one and a half, 1.2 centuries, which strangely enough I regard as the long run, uh, is minus 2.4% of GDP. And if you take out the wars, it's minus 2.2% of GDP. So the real world forces them to run deficits, even though their politics pushes them to say they should run surpluses. That's yeah. why they have the dollar. Pardon? The Pardon? <coughs> oh, yeah, that's the other they thing. Have, I mean, they yeah. have the dollar. I mean, they can have deficits for as long as they... They don't need to worry about the trade deficit side the of things. Yeah. Also, they can run deficits. That's right. Because they can... If you speak up. So if you want to hear hold by the rest <coughs> of the audience, you need to talk more loudly. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, but... Um, yeah, uh, the, the, one of the greatest mistakes in, in economic policy was allowing the American dollar to become the reserve currency, because Keynes's idea was a bank call, which would be an international currency, issued in proportion to the size of the GDPs of different countries. Fixed exchange rate was the rule, but if you ran a trade deficit, you'd be forced to devalue. If you ran a trade surplus, not only would you be forced to revalue, you'd also be forced to lend money from your surplus to developing countries. So Keynes saw a de potential depressing tendency out of having penalties for deficit countries and not for surpluses, he wanted to stop that happening. With, with Harry Dexter White from the American delegation insisting the American dollar became the reserve currency, that all got totally stuffed up and it gave us Donald Trump in the long run. Yeah. The current international monetary system is uh, at present unsustainable. Yeah. When do you expect the change and what would be the future of the international uh, monetary system? How well, it's, it's actually happening right now because uh, Thank you. <laughs> America is helping unite uh, all its enemies. <coughs> Good on in America. Uh, and Donald Trump's doing a large part of that. So France, <laughs> sorry, um, Russia, China and uh, to some extent the Arabic countries are trying to work on a parallel payment system that doesn't use the American dollar. It'll still instead use a basket of currencies as its reference amount. Now, the larger the basket, the more you are like having a bank call, not linked to any particular national economy. So I think Donald Trump has done a world a marvellous favour by making it, making it absolutely sensible to get the hell out of the American monetary system for international trade. How far it'll go, I don't know, but the development has certainly happened right now. So that should be, I think, starting in the next year or two. Uh, have you uh, tried to model inflation in your Minsky? Oh, yeah. And I get deflation out of it because uh, the, if you think about what, what's the normal trend in a capitalist economy, because you have, it's called rising, rising labour productivity. In fact, it's rising efficiency of machinery needing less workers. And the real cause of, even I have a typical supply and demand analysis, so the fly, flow of monetary supply and the flow of monetary demand determine the rate of change of prices. So it's straight what neoclassicals would accept as, a, as their supply and demand vision in a monetary model. I get a tendency to deflation because over time of the workers' wages share is the main thing that causes, infl causes inflation to rise if it's going up. If the wages share is going down and the, in the model the wages share does decline, <coughs> one technical outcome of the model, it has what's called a emergent property, is that even though the capitalists are the ones doing the borrowing in the model I've shown you, the capitalist income flatlines relatively. It's the, as the banker's share goes up because of rising debt to GDP, it's the worker's share that falls. So the workers pay for the debt, even though they're not the ones doing the borrowing. And when I add borrowing by them, it gets worse, because that's then their borrowing supports housing bubbles and Ponzi schemes that don't add to the capacity to service the debt. So uh, it's, inflation is a monetary phenomenon driven by class conflict where workers lose out to the bankers and the capitalists think everything is wonderful until the system collapses. 
<laughs> sorry, okay, yeah. From yeah. So Speak up. You described very well your debate with Krugman a few years ago, but have you considered, do you think the newest papers, for example, by Bruno Meyer Sannikov, the A3 of Money, or Kumhoff, which are only classical papers in trying to model endogenous money theory, do you think that there's going to be a change, conversion, or something that I can just spirit in the near future? Michael's a great mate of mine, one of my best friends. And he is the, about the only neoclassical economist who properly understands money creation. And he does, he's done models using standard dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models that give you money creation where a money creation world is very different to a loanable funds world. So we're totally on the same page about that. Um, but if, and if you look at what's done by other economists, when they use DSG models, they end up getting similar results, which they don't like. So they use another technology they've developed called overlapping generations models, OLGs. Now, OLGs are a clumsy attempt to deal with time. And with the OLG model, they find the result, there's no change in the allocation between the two. So they think, well, we might as well stick with the simpler model of loanable funds. And given how dedicated they are to avoiding thinking about the monetary system, I think they'll say, look at a couple of OLG models, so it doesn't have any real impact, we can continue using loanable funds. So I do not expect them to reform themselves. Yeah. Now, do you think that money can be created not only by banks making loans, but also by consumers maximizing their credit cards? Well, that is the same thing. If you maximize your credit card, you're creating a bank loan. Well, except it's, yeah, okay. okay. But I mean, it's, it's a sort of flexible um, amount of loan that the consumers decide to take out compared to what their max on their card might be. Well, that's exactly the same. That, that, that is workers financing. That, that's the banks are allowing them to create it. The consumers are creating it. Well, and so the same thing applies with a, with a, with a firm borrowing money. Uh, this, when, when we started doing endogenous money theory with Basil Moore back in the late 70s, Basil's main model was what's called lines of credit. So a, a, bank, a, a, a company, a large company like General Motors would negotiate a line of credit that might involve 30 different banks and that one might be a, like a, a $1 billion line of credit. So that was a ceiling, like a credit card ceiling, that the General Motors could access whenever it needed to for wage demands or changes in cost of inputs and so on. And so it's a, it's a mutual decision between the two. That was the point of the Bundesbank statement early on. It isn't that banks create money and, oh, damn, this stuff pours on the rest of us and we don't want it. Banks have to entice us to want that money or actual situation in the economy has to entice us. So it is a two-way street. Of course, it can turn, that's why I've got repayment shown separately to lending, okay, because the banks can do the lending, uh, it's the agents who are already in debt who can decide to repay faster than the banks might want. So when you see a crisis like 2008, it's both the banks stopping the lending and also people who are in debt trying to get the hell out of it and selling assets, liquidating, and therefore reducing the money supply in the same way that uh, loans going negative, if it happens, would reduce money supply. We have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Steve, you, uh, you talked about the role of uh, wages uh, to inflation or deflation. Mm -hmm. What about productivity? So is it, is it more unit labor cost or is it the share of wages? When, when you look at the, the one of the intriguing things, like I, I, when I found I wanted to bring inflation into the model, I really hated the fact that I had to use supply and demand to do it because I would have preferred to use Koleski's idea of, a, of markup pricing. When I solved the equations, the two are identical. So Koleski's markup pricing equation says that prices are a markup on prime cost, where prime costs are fundamentally wages, divided by labour productivity. So it does turn up there. So a high rate of labour productivity will give you a greater rate of deflation. And that's what we've seen historically as well, of course. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much. Steve. Thank you.